life, my lifestyle, you know, publicly. And they are how you're going to be brave. Because Abbasano, they're doing your nursing. No more cry or more be free outside, and then you will cry by my tongue. Many now be and banter my and why a team. I'm a name in our work or so. Like a year late, yeah. Like a big year better in your mind. Times have been a bit rough because um, things that we used to do formally now you can't do. Places that you used to go freely now you cannot go because of this COVID thing. But all in all, I would say it's a moving time. I believe with time it, it will go. So I wouldn't have too much to complain about. Yeah. I'm Pacho Vase in Owawo. Me Pacho Wine. Pacho Dabi. Hi, Mawo. Oh, Mawo. Mawo na. I haven't taken the vaccine yet because I'm skeptic about it, about the COVID. So, I haven't taken the vaccine yet. Yes, please. Taking the vaccine. I've taken the vaccine. I took it like. They came to school in our school and then we took the bus. I didn't see the mouth over seeing it. Because to be a bit more common, not a bit more kaka. It's not Miss Mystery say a bit meet Miss Meet me any bit. It's not my mouth over. My gang chairman say hello. Yeah, yeah. I didn't miss a meal because of the belief in the Christianity in Germany. No, why? Because I was say my boy me home by in three hours no. Say I ran away home. Concerning my decision of not taking 
because I believe that vaccines are produced for years, five years. When it's been produced, it's been tested for years. And uh, COVID-19 vaccine was really tested for only six months. So I was not convinced of taking the vaccine. So up to now, I haven't taken my vaccine yet. I took the vaccine because I believe it can help combat the mutations of COVID-19. For the decision of taking the COVID-19 vaccine, I decided to take it myself, just to take it, to protect myself. Um, personal reasons, but I don't think, um, I'm still making my findings. I don't know. No, I didn't tell you. I follow this um, COVID thing and I follow Hello, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Um, you're welcome to the College of Physicians and Surgeons where this afternoon we're going to have a scientific meeting. It's my first scientific meeting. I'm very excited to be here. And uh, you are all here by invitation, as I understand, which makes you all very important, very special people. It's my pleasure to meet you all. Um, I'm assuming you all have one of these. You all have a program. Um, it says today's theme is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic be starting the program very soon and having conversations with people to help understand uh, what it battle the disease both from uh, the medical perspective and from the perspective of being a patient uh, we'll talk about how it has affected the workplace business personal lives, family life, and how people still see this disease. It's going to be a very exciting conversation. It will start soon. Uh, apologies for the delay. We are uh, setting up a link so that one of our guests can join us via Zoom. That will be established very shortly, and then we'll be able to start. But you know, I've been thinking about this theme, impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the new normal the new normal this thing has been in ghana since march last year hands up if you feel normal i know i don't it's the strangest thing it has really changed our reality but you will not we are not all our reality most of us are acting as if we're still in the old reality because it's not normal but the truth is we are required to act as if this is the new normal that's the only way we will survive so today I think the insights that we will get from our panelists and from you will really help us start to retune our minds to this new normal. Maybe from tomorrow, it'll be a bit more normal for all of us. I'm made to understand that they are vigorously working on that problem. Very soon, we'll be ready to get started. Thank you very much for your patience. Hello?
हेलो for a long time. Hello. Yes, you might. Hello. Hello. हेलो 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 वन कोजो यंग सिंह सेड हेलो यू गाइस ऑल रिस्पोंडेड ओ कोजो प्लीज यू कैन लीव नाउ यू कैन टेक ऑल द शाइन लाइक दैट और इफ आई वाज अ पास्टर एंड आई सेड एवरीबॉडी हु रिस्पोंड्स विल गेट अ न्यू वीएच विद इन द नेक्स्ट 3 मंथ्स विल यू से वुड यू रिस्पोंड और नॉट हेलो आई नो दे आर मोर रिस्पोंडिंग All right, so uh, we are just facing some little bit of technological challenges and then some uh, HR challenges. I see some HR people there. Uh, one of our panelists had some small something something. So we'll be here in just a bit. And then we're also trying to get Dr. Asiedu Befin, who is an important stakeholder in this discussion, to join online. So just give us, would you how many minutes? Five. Okay, just so you can blame Kojo for the delays, I've got him back. Uh, so we will be back on very very soon, and then we'll start the discussion. So please pardon us. Thank you. Hello. So. Hello. Try two. 
Hello. Economical nationwide, it affected everyone because some people were not able to go to work. But my side, it was not hard because I did this side work and uh, people didn't like, they can't avoid buying it because it is a food and they have to consume. COVID has affected me a lot in terms of education. It has affected me in the sense that virtual learning is not as effective as physical face-to-face -face learning. So grades and all that, COVID has affected me in that aspect. COVID-19 has really... No, it hasn't affected me in any way. Just that we didn't go to school very early as we used to. That's the only way I can say COVID-19 pandemic has affected me. Okay. Mate, anyway. Maybe my nyakpaka watu, ame agblan. Like. Okay. Um, financial wise, um, not being able to have access to you know public life, my lifestyle you know publicly. And yeah, how you going to be free? Cause abasa no, you don't even say. No more cry or outside, and my tongue. I and why a team. I'm a in our Like a year late, yeah, Naka, Bibia, better Times have been a bit rough because um, things that we used to do formally now you can't do. Places that you used to go freely now. Hello. You don't want your VAJ. Hello, great, great. So um, our technological challenges are gradually being solved. Some of the HR ones too are being solved. So we would want to start at this point because uh, we are really, really behind time, but we'll try to make up for that. So at this point, we'll call on Dr. Salamatu Ata Nangtogma to give us the opening prayer. Thank you very much. Please, can we be prepared for the for a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for today. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of health. We thank you for the opportunity of another year of an AGSM. And we thank you for this public lecture. We pray that you be with us and grant us clarity. In Jesus' name, amen. Great. So growing up and then in school, 
when we hear of a lecture, the usual thing is you come and sit down. Lecturer comes, boom, 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 boom. Ask a few questions, catch a few people sleeping, and then quickly the lecture is done and you are gone. Typically, 30 minutes to time, you are just waiting to leave. So this time, we want to change insights more. So this time, it's more interaction. We want to make it interactive, talk to people, get their experiences while still learning at the same time. That is why this public lecture is a bit different from the usual public lectures that we know. It's more of a discussion. So if you are anticipating the boom, 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 and quick questions and go home, this is completely different. We'll move straight to the dignitaries who are among us. All of us here are important. Those who have even joined us online are very, very important people. But, you know, among the equals, there are a few more equals that we have to acknowledge who have graced the occasion. Reverend Re Reynold Degajo of Calvary Baptist Church is with us today. And when it comes to COVID, it's very, very important to have our religious, uh, uh, the clergy and the religious among us supporting us to make things happen. Professor Samuel Hine, who is the chair of the Faculty of Psychiatry, is also with us. Prof, please give us a wave offering. We know COVID has a lot of psychological issues that goes with it, so thank you for coming. Joe who is the chief examiner, faculty of oncology, is here with us as well. Dr. Josephine Akbalu, please also give us a, a wave offering. She's the chair of the faculty of internal medicine. And um, we also have vice rector, the vice boss of the college himself. Also with us, Dr. Henry Lawson. So, since Dr. Lawson has waved, uh, we'll jump behind Dr. Lawson and move to the, the men in suit. So, Alfred Atakra, who is the head of talent and learning, Ecobank, is also with us. Please give us a nice one. And then, Madame Betty Amofa, also an HR officer at Ecobank. I'm told she is the in house. She, she reminds people about COVID and making sure they are following protocol. More like COVID police. So let's give her another clap. All right. So be introducing people as they come. But at this juncture, we'll call on Vice Rector to give us a few opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think routinely the college organizes the annual general scientific meeting every year. This is our 18th that we're organizing. But we do not see this program as a routine. Uh, we think that COVID is with us and there's a, the tempo is dying down where people are slowly slipping back into what they used to do, which is putting everybody at risk. And so the college uh, put a team together, a very lovely team, who came up with all these beautiful ideas that we should reach out to people in a different manner. Um, on Sunday, we went to th three churches and offered uh, the COVID vaccine for members. And we were surprised that a church would have at, as many as 285 people coming out to take the vaccine for the first time. It tells us that there's still work to be done with COVID. And so we shouldn't rest on our oars. We should keep pushing. And the college is doing its best to do that. So on behalf of the rector of the college, Professor Richard Adanu, who is in Kumasi now on another assignment, I want to welcome you all to the college and enjoy the program. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Rector. Um, Kojo is still itching to join me here, but for what he did at the beginning, I'm not going to allow him to come. So Kojo, you will be there. So among us are very important people who would be sharing their experiences with us. Some have had COVID themselves. Even the vice rector himself or vice rector 
has had it himself. But then these are people who have faced COVID in different facets of society. From somebody who asked, what, what has the bank got to do with COVID? What has music got to do with COVID? And what has Dr. Oliver Komi got to do with COVID? So we would like to in introduce our panelists for today. And these are three experienced people in their own spheres, but the thing that joins all of, them, all of them is COVID. So Dr. Joseph Oliver Komi is a fellow of the West Africa College of Physicians. He also has an MPH, a master's in public health, and he's an infectious disease specialist and a senior specialist with the Ghana Health Service. He's also the acting director of the Ghana Infectious Disease Center. He has been the lead in Ghana's fight. Ghana's fight for various infectious diseases like Ebola, COVID, and even yellow fever. He's also involved in TB management. Since he left school, he's always been an infectious disease arena. His main interests are in multi-drug resistance, HIV, HIV in the elderly, drug resistance, TB, and he's married with three boys, and he's a true phobia and Arsenal fan. Boss, give me one. You support the teams I support. Uh, all the panelists who don't support these two teams, please, you will not go to the panel today. So let's give him a clap as he moves up to join them, to sit on the panel. Next is Dr. Daphne. Okay, I've given you doctor because you're in the college. Don't worry. Uh, Mrs. Daphne Opong, she holds an MBA in human resources and also a BCom. She's a human resource leader with extensive sub-Saharan African regional experience. She's skilled at creating people's strategies and solutions, building talent, leading teams successfully to drive business results. She has leveraged on her professional background and business acumen to deliver strategic solutions to meet business objectives. She's a well-rounded HR executive and experienced in mergers and acquisitions. And strategic business partnering, partnering, change management, talent management, talent acquisition, team and leadership development. Are you not clapping? Yeah. Employee engagement, employee value production, among others. She holds a master's degree in human resource management from Paris Graduate uh, School of Management and a Bachelor of Commerce degree from UCC. She loves to spend time with her family and enjoy nature. Let's give her a clap as she goes. She's a very, very big woman. Increase the volume, like, increase the volume. Nice one, nice one. So at this juncture, uh, I think I have to have mercy on my, my co-moderator MC, Kojo Youngson of the Joy FM. Give him a clap. You give him a clap. I'm forgiving him. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Selome. Let me do this before he changes his mind. Um, uh, Let's meet our next two panelists. First, Dr. Franklin Asiedu Bequin. Uh, he's a medical doctor, he's a public health physician with specialization in applied epidemiology and disease control. He's got over 20 years' experience in this. Uh, Dr. Asiedu Bequin is a fellow of the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons. He's a facilitator for the Faculty of Public Health. Now, he was a consultant for the World Health Organization, as well as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. He's been the lead investigator in several outbreaks, including cholera, pandemic influenza, uh, and yellow fever. Dr. Asiedu Bekwe is the leader of the surveillance thematic area for the Ghana COVID-19 response. He's the co-chair of the Ghana One Health Platform. He's the convener of the National Public Health Emergency Operations Center. And he's the current director of public health at the Ghana Health Service. He'll be joining us electronically, Dr. Franklin Asidu Bekwe. Now, I've been looking forward to this one. 
everyone in this room has danced to this man's music before, unless you are allergic to music, which I hear is a real medical condition. All right, Edward Nana Poku Ose is what the government calls him. Uh, but we call him Hammer of the last two. He's a multiple award-winning music producer, instrumentalist, and a businessman. Now, after his A-level at, um, oh, what a pity, Presbyterian Boys Secondary School. Yes, yes, yes. I'm starting to realize nobody is perfect. <laughs> yes, yes, after his A-levels at Presec, uh, all the way back in, yeah, amen. All the way back in 1996, which makes you my mate. Yes, A-levels in 96, huh? Wow. Um, he was 19 years old at the time, and uh, he immediately plunged into the music industry and began his debut production, which happened to be Obrafo's Paimuka album. I bought that cassette. Uh, in 1999, uh, that album came out, and it is, to this day, the highest-selling Hip Life album. He was the youngest producer to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award all the way back in 2013 for his outstanding contribution to music. His record label became a haven for young talent who craved an alternative to street life. Hammer also served uh, Musicians Union of Ghana Musica uh, as director of hip hop and hip life for eight years. In 2017, Hammer took a break from music when he cut a deal with the CEO, Gottfried Obing Boating, to successfully launch A1 Bakery. He's currently an equity shareholder, managing partner, and the managing director of Accra Operations. He also founded Image Vault Africa, which is a media consultancy. They've got experience and expertise in marketing, communication, branding, and advertising and they handle several high-profile corporate clients. Let's put our hands together, make it loud for Hammer of the last two. Right, it looks like we're ready to get started with our conversations for today, aren't we, Dr. Salome? Oh, yes, we are started, and... Uh I've forgiven you so that we can work together. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So uh, time is fast spent. So we'll dive straight into it. And uh, I'm sure all of us watched the videos that were playing or the interviews from the public. Some of these went as far as Sefi. Some people also interviewed people in Asaman, Kese, other places in the country. And what struck me was the fact that a very educated young gentleman, I'm sure if you watch the videos, who has graduated from university says he does not believe COVID is real. He doesn't believe COVID is real. Hammer, I want to start with you. Can you? I want to begin with Hammer so that he can hammer that question for us. Hammer, is COVID real? Sorry. Hammer, is COVID real? And how do you know it's even real? Um, very. I believe. I don't know what I had, but uh, I tested positive for COVID, and I got all the symptoms the worst of the symptoms actually, because I had a lot of underlying and uh, I also hadn't taken the vaccine. So I was in a very bad place. So uh, I know it was COVID because um, it was COVID. I mean, there's no other explanation to it. It was, it was COVID and um, it, 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 it disguised as uh, typhoid or malaria in the beginning. I kept going back and forth. I took two courses of quartem, and I was treated for typhoid as well. And uh, it took a different turn after that. 
they took a different turn after that. It, it became, it went on steroids. Like, it took another turn, totally different turn. So, what, what do you mean by it took a different turn? You're treating malaria, and you're expecting to, to, for it to sub, subside. Yes. And all of a sudden, you have something that you have never experienced. You can't even walk. When I reached the hospital, my saturation was 79, uh, 78. It's supposed to be uh, almost 100. Yes. And I couldn't breathe. And so wow. I was just lucky. Wow. I reached the hospital the time I reached there. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So COVID is real. It is, yeah. So, Dr. Komi, but we have heard that, I mean, the cases in Ghana are almost finished. There are no people getting COVID anymore. I mean, things are going normal. Christmas is coming. We are all in the market. He claims COVID is real. You are the center. I heard it's empty. Is this still real? Well, COVID is still real. Um, if you've studied the pattern of COVID, last year, by this time, our COVID centers were empty. So we had a good Christmas. And January, February, March, we experienced the goodness of the Christmas. So this year also, between October till date, we've had on the average one, two cases a month on admission. So their centers are empty. The OPDs, however, tend to record 10 cases, 15 cases, and these are walk-in cases, so they are not sick. So generally, we'll see that the numbers have gone down, and it's following the, the trend. We all know that there are waves. Last year, by this time, we were all laughing at the Europeans that they were in a wave towards the Christmas. So they didn't enjoy Christmas, and everybody rushed to um, Africa to enjoy Christmas. This year, they are in a wave. They are not going to enjoy Christmas, and they all come down to enjoy Christmas. So we are preparing for our wave from January. So for now, we don't have too many cases, but COVID is still real. Uh, I'm sure uh, there are lots of questions on our minds about Omicron and so forth. So we're glad you're here. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about, about something in particular, uh, Daphne. How has COVID affected work and the business space? I mean, people get sick all the time. COVID is not the first disease. Uh, but what is it that, is, that this particular virus has done to how businesses operate, which is different from anything before it? Uh, thank you so much, um, Kojo. I think that it, it was different for everybody, including businesses. And um, we had to organize ourselves to be able to uh, work in the midst of a pandemic, to be able to still serve our customers because we have contracts with our customers. We also have a contract with our stakeholders or shareholders to ensure that we deliver the value. And so for businesses, we needed to rethink how we could protect our staff first and foremost, how we could, you know, um, tame the anxiety um, that COVID brought, how we could organize our workflow systems to ensure that while staff are comforted by the fact that they have support systems, um, we could also date such that our customers will be served because people were not waiting for their businesses to collapse just because there was COVID. So we had to organize ourselves. And I think that the businesses that were able to organize themselves were those who had been planning, you know, way ahead in terms of how to transact digitally, how to improve their systems, you know, to be able to work using electronic uh, platforms. And so for those who were not ready, it was a time for them to double up, you know, just to hasten and put processes in place. We also needed to reach out to our customers and educate them as quickly as possible on how best, you know, in the safe and comfort of their homes, they could still do what they do 
when they visit us, visit us on site, you know. So it wasn't only for banks where I, uh, you know, identify with, but across all businesses, I think that we had to do things virtually. We had to innovate. We had to learn how to use those um, technology platforms to be able to reach our customers. So that is how we were all impacted. D did you lose staff? Did you have to let people go? No, not at all. Thankfully, I think that Ecobank was a step ahead in terms of technology. Um, and so we just had to quickly upskill our people to say, these are the platforms we have. We need to now move on to those platforms. Um, we actually got more businesses because um, for those of us who pay cash, for example, we needed to now increase our routes to ensure that we and our customers who, you know, did not have means of transacting digitally. So for Ecobank, we're able to keep our staff. We continue to keep our staff and we have no intentions of, you know, reducing our staff because of COVID. Uh, Hama, you have a very front-facing role. Um, you, you do a lot of the publicity for the company that you are now an equity, um, you know, shareholder in. Uh, and then, of course, you've got your uh, media consultancy. Did you find that having COVID and actually making it known that you had COVID brought with it any kind of stigma? Well, um, I took a different route when I decided to go public. I... I wasn't look. I, I was above stigma because I actually deal with people who need to deal with me. But what I found out was that a lot of people, even families of survivors, I mean, uh, people who victims of people who died from COVID, they don't even want to say their 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 relatives died of COVID because people then shun them. I decided that I was going to go all out and educate because my kids are in school, and I know that uh, they might get this thing from their friends saying your dad got COVID and all. So I, I decided to educate them instead of just come out and say, I survived it. I, not, I, I really, really went through the worst of COVID. So I understood the disease from experience. And one thing that happened that I didn't put out in the open was the psychological effect. An, un an unprofessional nurse did something that really, really broke me. It would have killed me, actually. Um, there was this patient who was next to my room who kept making sounds in the night whenever everything stopped. When all sounds were, you know, down, you could hear him doing, mm, mm. Mm. So, one Friday, I just told the nurse that, oh, last night, I, I think that the guy is getting better because last night I didn't hear him. And she was like, oh, the guy died 8 o'clock yesterday evening. And ever since she said that, I went through panic attacks. I was afraid because according to them, my COVID was more serious than his. And if mine was serious and his, he died, then, and I was wondering, why did you tell me this? And every evening, I go, I go crazy. Like, I'm, I'm here thinking what will happen. And you see, these are the things that are very, very important. But it's a psychological effect. You know, I thought I was going to go. And I started, you know, calling everybody I needed to call to, to make sure that if something happens, you know, they would know what to do. So I think the stigma part is just people needed to know that you can recover and go back to normal. And uh, because people don't understand that you can recover, they tend to have this effect, um, um, uh, attitude like towards people who have recovered or who have exposed the fact that they have experienced COVID. And so that's, that's I, I didn't care about it because I wanted to really go all out for my children's sake. I needed them to understand how serious it was. 
you know. I didn't put out every video. I have about almost 200 videos that I made, short videos, one minute videos. I apologize to people I have wronged in the past. I, I still have those videos and I sent it to them. You know, anybody that I, I, feel, I felt like I needed to make peace with, I did. Um, it, w it, was, it was, I was there. I, I met my end and I, 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 I came to terms with it because I didn't think I would get out of that hospital. You know, I went through 12 oxygen tanks, the big ones, wow. 12 of them before I, I, I came to 90, my, my breathing and everything stabilized. So I was there. Wow. Wow. I think I watched one of your videos and I was like, wow. For a man to get to the point of wanting to make peace, um, that's poignant and, and quite scary. Uh, we, we hear of long COVID. Uh, since you recovered, I'll come to Dr. Oliver Komi, but since you recovered, uh, we've heard of long COVID. Uh, do you still feel some things here and there, or you are just back to full-time full, full fitness? Back to full-time. I, I haven't experienced anything yet. I was told that I might okay. experience something. Okay. I had some chest pains, uh, but it I called the doctor and he prescribed something and it just, but that, that was the week or two after I, I got home. Okay. And uh, I was still not, you know, my, my energy levels had dropped totally. You know, walking from here to you, I'll pant wow. to be able to do that. You know, no energy, like a baby. You don't have any energy at all. Wow. So after that, I haven't experienced anything anymore. Wow. Yeah. Dr. Oliver Komi, what is this thing about long COVID? Um, he, he got well and he went. So, but we keep hearing long COVID, that some people sometimes don't have their smell back after weeks. Uh, can you shed some light on that? Okay, so we all will react differently to any infection. There are some people whom we thought had underlying illnesses, so they were not going to recover quickly from COVID, but had 85-year-olds recover without any problems, had diabetics recover without any problems. So in the beginning, we didn't know about long COVID. But then it took some health workers who knew themselves very well to start describing that even after three weeks, three weeks after when they thought everything should it's be fine. over, they were still experiencing the COVID-like symptoms. So with time, other people also described similar symptoms and we came up with a coin long, uh, with the term um, long, long COVID. COVID. And long COVID should be less than more than four weeks after, after you have been declared to have recovered. So long COVID is more or less the complications or the after effects of COVID. And it's not, as I said, because you had severe COVID, you should have long COVID. There were people who had mild symptoms. Loss of smell was the only thing they had. And three months down the line, they still had a recovered their sense of smell. And that is the long COVID. Wow. Any other experiences from the, the treatment center? What was some of the, the most challenging day that you ever had? I say that um, I'm, I'm happy what Hamas said about the psycho <laughs> so the psychological effects. It looks as if almost all of us, throughout the period of COVID, the key thing we looked at was the difficulty in breathing. Once somebody cannot breathe well, he needs oxygen. Give him oxygen. But I can tell you, my nurses say in the middle of the night, that is when you hear. So he's, he wasn't the only one. He was doing videos. Others were singing in bed. Others were shouting in bed. Others would pray throughout the night. Just to be sure that they are making peace with God. I had one lady, I moved out of the ICU into the normal area. And that lady was singing from the ICU into the normal. We had to call in the clinical psychologist 
to find out whether everything was okay. She just laughed at us and told us we thought she was crazy. She wasn't crazy. We were not in the ICU with her. And for her to come out of the ICU after 22 days, she needed to give thanks to God. So she wasn't crazy. Wow. She was just experiencing something else. Wow. So, so that's, that's on the patient side, yes. isn't it? Hama has shared his experience. Uh, were you okay psychologically yourself? Sometimes seeing people die, and not to make us all sad, but we had our own rector here, even in the treatment center. And unfortunately, was one of the first people who passed on from COVID. Uh, how was your own, your own mental health like? Well, for me, uh, I had to stay away from my family for close to five months before I moved into, wow. if you are married, you have a fair lady, and you <laughs> have to move out of the room and stay in the hall or sometimes stay with your mother for five months before you go back home. That was traumatic. I don't wow. want to explain the trauma, but I, I'm sure you understand. <laughs> in fact, when traumatic. you said it, Kojo, who is not the, I mean, you, you see people go to funeral and cry louder than the chief mourner. Yeah. That's what Kojo was doing beside me. Oh. When you said he was a, mm. yeah, but that, 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 And you see, we were, nobody knew about COVID. COVID was new in March 2020. And then we had volunteered to lead COVID. Some people didn't think we needed to come back into society once we were with the patients. So you go to a place and everybody's saying, that's the COVID doctor, he's around. So we were COVID invariably. We had a virus within us and we were, people looked at us and thought that we could spread the disease. So psychologically, it, it took a toll on us. It definitely must have been tough, eh? I remember in Fidium, we were also an isolation center. And then we went to, to town one time trying to organize people. And then one market woman just pointed. I was leading our team to go into the community to look for some people sometimes. So one market woman just said, ah, and yes, our doctor we no more have a COVID for so we were actually targeted. And when we found out one household had COVID and we had to go and counsel them on not leaving the household and other things, the grandmother who had had came to town, came to the hospital with eggs and then farm oil and those things they use, that he was coming to curse us. And a lot of our staff were scared. So it, it's quite a tough, tough, tough thing. Uh, I think Dr. C. Edu Bequin has joined us. Uh, Dr. Bequin, are you online? Fantastic. Uh, I think we can hear Dr. Uh, Asidu Bequin there. Let's give him a round of applause as he joins us. Uh, thank you very much for making the time, Doc. Uh, you sit in a, a unique position. You are one of the team that is steering the nation's efforts to combat this uh, pandemic. But the thing, the enemy keeps changing shape. Now we hear its latest incarnation is Omicron. And just this afternoon on the news, we heard that uh, due to the sequencing work that Uchi and other institutions have been doing, we now know that since the 21st of November, we have had Omicron cases here in Ghana. What does this mean in terms of the general population and how we're supposed to behave? Or should we just keep going business as usual?
Right. Now, Doc, I want you to stay with us because um, there's something I want to run by you. But first, I want to get Daphne's take on this because it's, it's, it's related. Um, in, in, in your workspace, in Echobank, how is vaccination going? Do you have policy about it? As you said, uh, if you don't vaccinate, you can't come to work. Do you have any rules that your business has set around vaccination? Uh, so thank you very much. I think that um, I wouldn't say we have rules. Um, right. Now, because Doc, I the world over, I don't think there are laws feedback you know, the enforcement of vaccination, those are all in the works. But we encourage people, you know, to take the vaccines. I must say that uh, presently in Ecobank, we have 70% of our staff fully vaccinated. We have another 14% partially vaccinated, waiting for the next um, second dose um, sometime this December. And then we have uh, about 16% who are unsure or have various different types of conditions for which reason not able to immediately take the vaccine. So uh, there are no strict rules. However, um, as vaccines are available and as the world wants to get rid of this um, disease, it is important that we all do vaccine together in a community where we need to ensure that personally we take responsibility and we ensure that the rest of the people who we interact with and come in contact with are also protected. So we will have um, policies and protocols in place um, at a certain point, I'm sure beginning of now, um, in terms of how those who are unvaccinated will be permitted into the buildings. Um, I'm sure the government will also put in place protocols for customers and people going to public places we will follow guidelines and we will also be guided by our own internal processes to ensure that our people are protected, our staff are protected, we are protecting each other, you know, and our families and all that. But I must say what we did was also to extend the vaccination exercises to all our dependents. I mean, you can't just say that you are vaccinating a staff because um, the person comes to sit with other staff. The person goes home and has family and other you know, workers. So we extended the vaccination at uh, whatever cost. Uh, vac vaccines are uh, free, but then we try to administer them on site in our premises, in our location. So it was easier for people to have it whilst at work. And so we asked that you bring your dependents, you know, and all the vendors, contractors, anybody who was present or is present and, and does some work for us uh, within our, our premises were extended these courtesies and so we ensure that our ecosystem our you know community was fully uh, protected and continue to be protected uh, now uh, thank you for that because that links directly to the other thing i wanted to ask dr acido uh, even though we pretend we're not we actually are in the middle of a health crisis this is a pandemic a global one this is an emergency that we are dealing with. Are we at the point where perhaps policymakers, Ghana Health Service, government of Ghana, should start thinking about making the vaccine compulsory? So far, only 7% of the population have received full vaccination. 20% have partial vac vaccination. We require at least 70% of this country to be vaccinated in order for it to even have meaning on a national level. Should we start thinking about making it mandatory?
Dr. Bakui, um, let me just go back a little bit. Um, it means there's that issue of vaccine hesitancy, isn't it? Which we are still worried about. Because the vaccines became available, in, at first we were worried that we're not getting vaccines. Now the vaccines have come and people are not vaccinating. What do you think is accounting for this? And how do we begin to combat it so that people actually go for the vaccines? If you watch the video, you realize a young educated person says COVID is not real. He will not go for the vaccines because he, it wasn't tested. So wh what do you say to such a person? Issue of vaccine hesitancy, isn't it? Which we are still worried about because the vaccines became available. In, at first, we were worried that we're not getting vaccines. Now the vaccines have come and people are not vaccinating. What do you think is accounting for this? And how do we begin to combat it so that people So um, we, we need to vaccinate Dr. Sidhu by Queen's internet a little bit. So hopefully he'll come back on. But at this juncture, we want to take... All right. Doc, please, you are back on. Can you go on? Dr. By Queen. Yes. You go on. Thank you very much, Dr. Franklin Asidubeku. Please uh, stay with us. Uh, for those of you who are joining us 
uh, electronically. Thank you so much for making the time. This is the 18th annual general and scientific meeting, uh, the public lecture on the theme impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the new normal. Media partners are Joy News, GTV, TV3, Ghana Web, Metro TV, and City TV. Now, I think at this point, it will be uh, a good time for us to interact a little bit. Uh, so I thought perhaps I'll come out and meet some of you, take maybe three questions or contributions. Uh, if you are joining us via Zoom and you would like to make a contribution or ask a question, please uh, raise your hand on Zoom and uh, we will get to you uh, as well. But uh, for those of us in here, uh, shall we show by hand? If you want to make a contribution, ask a question, share an insight or an experience, a story, we're happy to, uh, to learn from you. Okay, we've got this uh, gentleman here. Tell us your name, and then if you can keep your comments to about a minute, we would love you for that. Thank you. Hi, I am Manfredo Opong. I just have a question. And can I stand or I choose? Okay, so my question is about the vaccination. Um, just yesterday, a colleague of mine came to work, and according to him, I mean, he wasn't feeling well. Everyone saw it, and he said it's as a result of his vaccination. He went for his vaccine, and I mean, all of a sudden, he's beginning to face a lot of reactions, and he had to stay away from work. And yesterday was the only day he could report. And I just want to ask, I mean, yes, uh, His Excellency, the first gentleman of the nation, took his vaccination. Other dignitaries also took theirs. They, we never heard about any... Um, I mean, consequences, but there are certain things um, with regards to my friend. I want to ask, how sure are we that these vaccines are so safe that they may not have side effects on the general citizenry? Thank you. It's a great question. We'll take two more and then we'll get some answers. Um, any other hands? Do we have anyone on, uh, on Zoom who wants to throw? Oh, we've got a hand in the back. I'll come all the way to you, sir. Tell us your name and keep it to a minute. Thank you. All right, so my name is Jeffrey Atiko. Yes, so what the man on the screen, when he was making his statement, he mentioned that uh, the challenge before was no vaccine, no vaccine. And then this year we had the vaccine, but people are not willing to uh, go for, to be administered. So I, I spoke to, a f I've been speaking to people and the consensus that uh, they have some uh, perception about the vaccine. Some are spiritual and others are physical uh, 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 feedback that you get after they, admi uh, they administer the vaccine. So I just want to ask him if the education for people to understand that the vaccine, this is how it works. I think the education aspect is something that is lacking. People still have those perceptions about the vaccine. And I think it's one of the reasons why we are not seeing people coming out to get vaccinated. So how are they addressing that particular one? Another great question. All right, do we have one more before we go to our panelists for answers and responses? No? Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Asedu Bekwe, I hope you heard those questions. I think we'll have um, you and uh, uh, Dr. Komi share share the uh, answers to these questions. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Komi, if that's okay with you. So let me start with the, with the last um, question, asking about education. We, we all admit that we haven't done well when it comes to educating the general public about the vaccine. We had the opportunity maybe in June, July, where we had people dying and people were asking, give us the vaccines. We didn't have vaccines then. So if you go talking about benefits of the vaccine, the next question is, where is the vaccine? Then we now have vaccines. So we need to scale up. We need to improve our communication about the benefits of the vaccine. So yes, we have also acknowledged that. And we're counting on everybody, health workers, those who have been vaccinated, the media, public figures, anybody, you get and who can help us please come on board and let us edu and i thank the ghana college for this opportunity because 
as one avenue. We have about 229 people online. They are also ambassadors. You are hearing for the first time today, the vaccines are good. We have vaccine. Help us to educate people so that we can increase the number. I want to call on maybe the churches, the mosque. If you call on us on Sundays, when we come, we will vaccinate the people there. People talk about vaccine hesitancy, not because they do not want to vaccinate, but sometimes convenience. If I have to go to a center and spend two hours to be vaccinated, why do I waste my time? But then if you can come to my workplace and vaccinate me there, I'm sure that will increase the number. So yes, as for the spiritual aspect, we are also dealing with it. So we will increase our education on the vaccines and that will help with the uptake. effect of the vaccine um, from Dr. Asidu Bekwin. This gentleman here uh, says that his friend at work was visibly unwell after taking the vaccine. He's wondering, are these vaccines safe? I must add that um, adults, when we are given small injection, we complain. However, we take our young the babies for immunization. And when they are injected, and they, because they can't speak, you don't know what they are going to after giving them, let's say, sometimes five shots or five um, vaccines. <laughs> so it's true. We may get some side effects. I took the vaccine with my mother. She didn't get any effect. The next day, I had joint eight, and she was asking me, what is wrong with you, young man? <laughs> so we all may react differently. You may take the vaccine and not have any effect. Another person might take the vaccine and will break down. It doesn't mean that the vaccines are not safe. Somebody takes paracetamol, one tablet, and has a problem. Another person will take 20 for suicide and will still be sitting now with no problem. So I believe it's uh, individual makeups, but the benefits far outweigh the risks. The benefits far outweigh the risks. I think I'll, I'll, I'll just say that uh, the response we get to vaccines is just like 
appetition and rice. People take different shots of appetition. Some people go one full bottle, isn't it? And they are fine. Some also take one tot and they are, they are going to the gutter. Like rice, somebody likes jollof rice. Somebody likes wachi rice. Somebody likes plain rice. There's fried rice and there's also rice vermicelli. But they are all what? Rice. It depends on what you are exposed to. And we are different and we'll be responding differently as Dr. Oliver Komi is saying. But interestingly, I watched Dr. Oliver Komi's video of his vaccination. It wasn't easy. He was running away and was being held. On that, on that note of Dr. Oliver Komi, <laughs> running away from vaccination, even though he took it eventually, we'll take some videos of some key state actors or important people also and what they they are looking to do in the COVID space. And then we'll come back for the last set of questions so that we can close. <laughs> Running away from vaccination even though he took it eventually, we'll take some videos of some key state actors or important people also and what they, they are looking to do. In Well, whilst they are working on the, the, the videos, um, I would want to know, maybe share a few views from the, I mean, get a few views. I don't know. Pasta is here. How do the religious take this COVID thing? And what would you want to do to help the, the country to get out of what we are in at the moment? Thank you very much. As you say that the... <laughs> contributed a lot to making sure, because once you come to church, the protocols, the various structures and systems put in place to make sure that people observe the protocol by taking up their washing hands, uh, taking their temperature, and also in their no um, wearing their nose mask. May I also say that our church played host to um, the medical team on Sunday. And what we noticed is that we had about, over, about 284 people who came in to be vaccinated. Now, what that meant for us is that certain people had all kinds of perceptions about the vaccine. But for the vaccine to be brought to the doorsteps of church members, then spoke for alleviate the fears and also some conspiracy theory about the vaccine. And so once it came to the doorsteps, and it was on Sunday, where the number of people, I think some would not have come for it at all, but once it came to the doorsteps, of, that alone broke that fear and made people step out publicly to be vaccinated. I think that the church is doing a lot to make sure for us, every Sunday, there's education going on from the pulpit. Even before service starts, we make sure that people are aware that the COVID is real. Yeah. I won't let you sit down yet. What would you want to say then, since I've got you, to those who believe that COVID is some spiritual, 666, something, to finish us, and the vaccines on top of them are the, the, the crowning moment? What would you want to say to a church member, uh, uh, somebody like me who does not believe, or somebody else who does not believe? I think that the church is doing a lot to make sure. For uh, us, I believe that God protects all of us. But in protecting us, he also has given us the wisdom that we should apply. And so if somebody says he does not believe in it, this is spiritual, you need to see things that are happening around. And that alone is enough to tell you that this thing is real. If for the whole world to shut down, B, 
businesses to shut down. That should tell you that something we've never experienced before is happening. And that alone should let you know that you can't take this for granted. Right. So we pray. We ask God to protect us. But you, as an individual, will also need to apply a God-given wisdom to stay alive. Right. We pray. We believe God will protect us and keep us alive. But you have to apply the wisdom. Let's give Pastor a clap. I think that is a very powerful statement that uh, 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 will go to help everybody who is still uh, doubting here and there or not sure of what COVID is to, to speak to that. Hammer, you wanted to comment on that? Yeah, let me say this. Um, I think this business of vaccines, uh, conspiracy theories, um, this whole thing is getting, yeah. it's getting old. I think that we are not showing, mm. we are not showing enough of the reality. What we are showing is when you watch TV and you watch, um, you watch the billboards, all you're seeing is wash your hands, adhere to protocols. When HIV AIDS came and I was a kid, when you see TV, when you watch TV, all you see are people who are almost dying, lanky people who are drooling, hospital patients. We saw the reality, and people run for their lives. This is what we should show the people. We should stop sugarcoating and just expecting them to run to the vaccines. They have to see why they have to go for the vaccine. If you don't show these people that this is what you stand to get. Listen, if I had taken the vaccine, according to the doctor, I wouldn't have gotten to that level. I would have probably experienced some malaria and fought it. I wouldn't even have to come to the hospital. People, friends of mine have survived without even getting a quarter of what I got. You see, and the video I did, the reason why I didn't hold back my vulnerability and I put out weeping in the night in the hospital, afraid, calling for help, is because I needed people to see. You know, I thought I'd probably die in the night somewhere, so I was doing those videos so that when they come in the morning, they'll actually see what I went to do. And I wrote that they published them in my absence. I gave them permission to publish those videos in my absence if in case I didn't make it. This thing is real. It is within us, if within, I think this, uh, this Xmas, this Omicron thing, if we are going to be talking and chatting about this Omicron thing, we are in danger. We should cancel all gatherings for this Christmas because the Christmas is going to bring a lot of action. Partying, uh, people are going to be partying, nightclubs are going to be, things are going to be happening. And if we want to slow this, I saw it in my phone, that two cases have been recorded. If we want to slow this thing down, we need to reduce the festivities. We need to put a ban on nightclubs now. This Christmas, spend it with your family. Spend Christmas with your family. No jumping around. Uh, first, 2020. 22, we would have had about 700 cases and going because this Christmas will really make it happen. Um, thank you, Hammer, for stating that you want to decrease their work for me it's because I'm planning for January. And I must state here, you know, people feel that if you get all the jobs within the next three weeks, you are covered. If you are traveling, they ask you whether your last job was 28 days ago. That is when they think that you are fully covered. So please, if your last job is on the day before, that's 24th, and then no, 23rd, and Kojentri show is the 24th, and they say you must be fully vaccinated before you enter. You say, oh, I got my last job yesterday. If I'm there, I will tell you, you are not protected. 28 days time, come back. So I think that we cannot just say that we have been vaccinated. So 
open up. Let everybody enjoy. We need to really understand what we are doing. And thank you very much for bringing this up. Forgive me. We were just about to play some videos, but Doc, what you have said is very important. And I think we need to uh, let this, let, let's dwell on this for a moment. It takes 28 days for your vaccine to become fully functional and protective in your system. That means that if you are not vaccinated today, today, you should be counting yourself out of the Christmas festivities. Today, if you haven't got a vaccine today, if you are not one of the 7% of Ghana that is fully vaccinated, fully, not you've got one. If you are not one of that 7%, if you belong to the 93% of Ghanaians, you can't be thinking of going to events this Christmas. That's according to the medical experts. I just wanted that to sink in. All right. Well, I think the crux of what he has said also, to add to that, from what I understand is this. It's a simple analogy. You, you can't say God, you've prayed for God's protection. So you go and stand in the middle of the road. The car will still knock you. So even when we are vaccinated, it does not mean we should what, throw away our masks and then just go and party. Those who are even fully vaccinated, let's still keep our masks on and minimize our risk of getting infected. So I think this is a very good point where we would go back to the video and see what, us, what some of the people are saying and what some other actors in the space are saying. And then we'll come back and do our final round and wrap up. But you did this COVID or Oh, yeah, who may be? 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 I'm a student nurse and I've been seeing patients every day, COVID-19 patients every day at a TBA government hospital. So for me, I believe there's COVID-19. Um, oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I do not believe the COVID is Please, I believe there is COVID-19 because I'm a student nurse and I've been seeing patients every day, COVID-19 patients every day at a TBA government hospital. So, 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 I do follow public uh, protocols. That's the wearing of nose marks, washing of hands, using of sanitizers. I do really follow them. And I do follow the protocols in public. Yeah. And even in the house, sometimes I do. Because I don't know who is infected. Some people are infected, but they are really, really strong. You will not even know the difference between a COVID-19 patient and someone who is really, really healthy. So I do follow the protocols. Hello, what Pepe? Yeah, of course I do. That's why I am Yes, I do. Can you mention some of them? Oh, washing off my hands, sanitizing it, wearing my nose mask, keeping my six feet distance, and I think basically. Good. Uh, But your COVID ne kwambe so na afa so affect you. Oh actually, me am say me kun nya bi. Enti me hwe se bia wo ko mu na ade na o say ye so ye boye ho ban ama. Me so man kun nya bi. Me say ma me eh. Me hwe den ho e ha bia de abem since I mean hwe den believe we will say as still no. 
quite a so even with uh, no smacks now, yes, you know. I thought that was we I thought that was now home too. And I saw to tree and near my baby, I could tree. I'm a high. Oh, I'm a pa because I really am by you know, even quite a kind of a quick man, meeting me a quick man from a daughter to see a fiada. And she see any day. I might and many be able to come to me, and I see a fiada. Economically, nationwide, it affected everyone because some people were not able to go to work. But my side, it was not hard because I did this side work and uh, people didn't like, they can't avoid buying it because it is a food and they have to consume. COVID has affected me a lot in terms of education. It has affected me in the sense that virtual learning is not as effective as physical face-to-face -face learning. So grades and all that, COVID has affected me in that aspect. COVID-19 has really, no, it hasn't affected me in any way. Just that we didn't go to school very early as we used to. That's the only way I can say COVID-19 pandemic has affected me. Okay, Mati, anyway. Mm. Maybe my mm. mm. uh, like. Okay. Um, financial wise, um, not being able to have access to you know public life, my lifestyle in you know, a public way. And there, how you can be because Abasano, you join your say no more or more to outside, and then you grab my tunnel. I be a bit of I'm a man in a walk or so. Like a year, yeah, like a bit of 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 a do of a bit 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 of a of this COVID thing. But all in all, I will say it's a moving time. I believe with time it it will go, so I wouldn't have too much to complain about. Yeah. I'm Pacho Vasi, no wawo. Me Pacho I. Pacho da Abi. Hi, Mawo. Oh, Mawo. Mawo ni na. I haven't taken the vaccine yet. Because I'm skeptic about it, about the COVID. So I haven't taken the vaccine yet. Yes, please. Taken the vaccine. I've taken the vaccine. I took it's like they came to school in our school and then we took the vaccine. So I think I'm safe for now, but you are not safe with the vaccine until you follow the protocols. No. You haven't. Would you take it? No. No, please, I'm not. I didn't think I'm going to go Because today I'm going to go to the hospital. Because of uh, me believe in the Christianity uh, in German. No why? Because I was say my boy me home by free area no. Say area no one home. Say na a home here say me walk on you. Oh, me was in a bomb hobby. I was here in a tear to see. It is a warm walk and an armor by ya. Oh, and I say I didn't meet me before. Concerning my decision of not taking, because I believe that vaccines are produced for years, five years. When it's been produced, it's been tested for years. And a COVID 19 vaccine was really tested for only six months. So I was not convinced of taking the vaccine. So up to now, I haven't taken my vaccine yet. I took the vaccine because I believe it can help combat the mutations of COVID-19. For the decision of taking the COVID-19 vaccine, I decided to take it myself, just to take it to protect myself. Um, personal reasons, but I don't think um, I'm still making my findings. 
I follow this um, COVID thing and I followed it for a while. I believe people have taken the vaccine and they still can get infected. So my understanding of vaccine is once you take it, you don't get that infection anymore. But this one, you take it and you get it. And I think the Pfizer CEO himself, who is giving us the COVID vaccine, has not taken it. And he doesn't want to take it. So that challenges me a bit. But I believe with time, things will fall in their respective places. And if there is the need for me to take it, why not? I will. Wow. I hope we have all followed. I see some giggles. I see some mm. I see some mm. And I hear some things here and there. It's interesting that if you listen carefully, one person who believed COVID does not exist, when it came to whether it was having an impact, he said, yes, it was having economic impact. The same guy. Then somebody also talked about his religious beliefs. Then somebody is saying uh, it has to be tested for five years. Interestingly, some, some of these people have taken polio vaccine, isn't it? Measles vaccines and other vaccines that uh, uh, and they took to keep them alive up to this point. So they are very interesting talking points, just getting feedback from the public. I think you also realize that what people you may call, quote and unquote, illiterate or depending on the language they were speaking, for example, you realize those who were educated rather were trying to rationalize things and tell you why they would not take the vaccines. Uh, the woman who was not sure of the reason said she was doing her own research. So probably she'll be one of the first Ghanaians to discover a new vaccine for us. So uh, I'd like your take, each of you your takes on some of the issues that have come. Probably what I take from this is there's still a lot of work to be done uh, from the religious side, as two people mentioned, religious reasons, uh, from each of us here, maybe sharing our stories. Somebody took the vaccine because their husband had, got COVID. So we have a lot of work to be done. Uh, what are your thoughts on these? Well, I, I think that we shouldn't take vaccine hesitancy as, uh, as something mild. Uh, people have described vaccine hesitancy as being very complex, vaccine specific. You may be surprised that some of these people who do not want to take their COVID vaccine, if you bring the yellow fever vaccine today, they will take their yellow fever vaccine. So I do not want us to belittle these arguments about vaccine hesitancy. I believe it's about listening to them, engaging the people, trying to correct the myths with facts, and then they will move from one side to the other side. So for me, they are all right in how they are thinking at the moment. It's up to us who feel we know more to try and win them over to our side. Dr. Kovin says that we should do a lot more. Those who know more, those who have felt the disease, those who have taken the vaccines should do more. Madam Daphne. Yeah, I think that uh, Dr. Kovin has said it all. It's the right thing for us to do, you know, to take the va vaccine to protect ourselves and others. But we also have to make accommodations for how people are feeling and uh, continue to encourage and make the vaccine available at all times, you know, so that as we educate and create more of the awareness, people will warm up to it. I mean, in my institutions, we, in, in my institution, we are where we are, not because the vaccines were available when they were available at the time. It's taken a lot of convincing, a lot of talking to my colleague is here who uh, you introduced as the COVID lady. You have no idea the kind of work she's put in, you know, to convince, encourage, you know, people to do. People have genuine reasons why. So it's all about the awareness, continuous availability of it, and, you know, and all of us collectively, the churches, institutions, friends and family, encouraging and supporting um, each other to make sure that at the right time when we're able to, and it's available, we should vaccinate for our own good. Come on. Yeah, so I, I'm taking a different route. I think that uh, this is dangerous. 
of uh, allowing people who just say things without a background. If you're asking health workers, do you believe it exists? They will have a better informed answer than somebody who says, I don't believe because I haven't seen anybody. What do you mean you, you don't believe because you haven't seen anybody? It's irrelevant whether you, you, you believe or not. It exists. So the question is not, do you believe it exists? It's about, do you want to live? You see, and I think that we should stop pampering this, the, these things. We need to go gaga on it. You know, it, it, it's important. You see, and I believe that, um, <sighs> I, I watch this and I'm sad. You know, I'm like, really? You people are really saying these things? It's dangerous. This thing is out there. And th this is what they are saying. And uh, flimsy ex excuses. I think that uh, people, we shouldn't let these things out. We shouldn't allow people to see uh, the remarks of the ignorant. We need to make sure that anybody who is speaking out there has an, is an inform has a, a better understanding. Otherwise, we will throw sand in people's eyes through our own mediums. And there are people, actors who are actually in groups in Ghana who are uh, uh, advocating the, the non-use of vaccines, saying that it is wrong. They don't have any background. They don't understand it. They just want to cause confusion. And I think that such people, such uh, groups on Facebook should also be, be, be handled by the police and stopped because you don't know what you're talking about. It is different if it's a doctor who is out there saying, look, I don't believe this, I don't trust this. But you people don't have any background. I can't, they are in fields that I don't understand. I would listen to them, you know, and take, but somebody who says things he doesn't understand, why should I, you know, be, be allowed to listen to them? I think it's wrong. Interesting. Um, of course, there will be varied opinions, but there's also place for sometimes uh, putting some measures in place. I think Daphne wants to say something again. Well, I, I was just <laughs> trying to, you know, um, comment a little bit on your... I think that we can't immediately put a militant approach to, to this. Mm -hmm. For those of us who believe in Christ, I think that even when Jesus was with us on earth, mm -hmm. <laughs> there were people who doubted him, even when all the miracles that we read about and everything was. So this is something that has come to us and happened on earth. I think that we need to continuously preach the importance and the need for all of us to get vaccinated. Some yeah. people have genuine, very genuine reason why, you know, they are not able to take the vaccines immediately. And I think that we should have reasonable accommodation, but eventually, and in the instances where even those with medical conditions that their own doctors have advised um, that they hold on a little before they take the vaccines. That's why we are putting protocols in place to say that, well, then if you have to be at a certain place, if you have to do A, B, and C, these are the conditions that you must also present yourself with, you know, to be able to enjoy and take advantage of such facilities. So I agree that you have faced a very difficult um, uh, situation and the realities of COVID ha ha have, have hit you, but it's important that we also um, warm up to the whole issue of, of this vaccine and the myths around it and how people feel about it. But eventually, I think with the continuous awareness, the availability of vaccines and you know people's circumstances, we will get the, the numbers that we need to, to get vaccinated, but we can't just you know, approach it in the way that I think some of us would like that it is, it is approached. It's very interesting, isn't it? Um, of course, they said even Jesus was very interesting. In one breath, he says, when somebody slaps you, you should do what? You turn the other cheek and let him slap, isn't it? But when he went to his own father's house and they were doing a harvest and people were selling and buying, in today's balance, he removed his belt and lashed people well, well in the church. So you never know what Jesus you are seeing on the day. 
So I think it explains both of them are right, but it depends on which Jesus you are seeing. Whether the Jesus who is turning the other cheek or the Jesus who is removing his belt and lashing. I think sometimes sanctions has its place, sometimes also encouragement has its place. So I believe we'll come to that. Uh, I, I saw something and I think somebody wants us to discuss. So that's one of the the notions about vaccines. You know, we are all happy that we are getting vaccinated. And I believe as a country, nobody has said that once you get vaccinated, you will not get COVID again. And I think that has been drummed home a couple of times. We see, and it's all, the world all over, we see that the vaccines prevent us from the severe COVID and reduces the mortality. And the, the people who die are those who get severe COVID. That is what we are aiming at. I can tell you, we in Ghana at the moment are not experiencing COVID or we do not fear COVID because our people are not dying. If people should start dying in, num in hundreds, look at what happened between July and September. Everybody started calling our government to bring vaccines. vaccines yeah. When people are dying, then we shall ask um, or believe that there is COVID. So, once you take the vaccine, you are sure that you will get COVID. But if you should get COVID, you will not suffer severe COVID. And once you don't suffer severe COVID, the probability of dying is, is, is out. So I think that let's remove this idea. Once I get the vaccine, I will not get COVID. I've had two vaccines, and I don't think that I will not get COVID again. I work with the virus every time. So there's a the possibility that maybe in the next wave, you will hear that maybe I got COVID. But I'll not be worried because I believe that I will not get severe COVID. That is a very important point to make, that the vaccines do not prevent you from not getting the disease at all. You can still get it, but you, will not like, you are not likely to get the severest forms of the disease and not likely to die from it. So please, those who believe that the fact that somebody got the vaccine and got the disease again, so you will not take the vaccines. That should explain it for you so that you go for the vaccines. Uh, our online uh, participants are asking a few questions and we'll take that at this moment. Um, Dr. Dorothy Ochre-Kilson Ochre wants to know, what is the role of the nation in carrying out, should I say, the nation in controlling those who are not keeping the preventive measures of the pandemic? Also, Fritz wants to know how many months vaccines really before the second dosage. I think this has relations to sometimes when you take the first, the second dose is not available. Let me take just one or two more and then we would just uh, come, come back into line. Mm -hmm. Somebody heard from <laughs> Dr. Oliver Komi. So many waves. Uh, today, this week, we are flattening the wave, flattening the curve. What accounts for these waves? Okay, so generally, we know that um, these viruses mutate over time. And then what brings or what trans, uh, facilitates transmission of COVID is when we start coming together. We say that the virus moves when the people are moving. So you realize that we are just entering the winter period in the West. So they are becoming, they are getting closer to each other. We all know that in the West, they tend to have the flu season. So they have winter and they have the flu. So definitely they are coming closer to each other. We are organizing programs indoors. So it's going to facilitate that transmission. Why is it that we got worse cases in January? What did we do in December? Or what happens in December? Families come together. We also have our version of the winter, Hamatan. Oh, Hamatan. Are you going to say that when families get together, everybody will be wearing a mask? Will you throw a party and ask everybody to wear a mask? Sometimes we need, it's our own actions that fuels the transmission, and then we have a wave. Remember that as soon as we get a wave, everybody is whipped into line. We wear our mask, we do not go to parties, and then the virus dies down. And once it dies down, then we say, oh, the virus is gone, and we start. So it's the human actions that continue to fuel these particular waves, and also the seasons and times. Uh, if Dr. Sia Dubakui is with, still with us, I think um, we would want to find out from Dr. Bekui, what is government doing to get people in line? Um, 
that's been the worry of quite a number of those online. That maybe I have taken my vaccine. Uh, doc has taken his vaccine. But the patient to the hospital has refused to take the vaccine. He too is not wearing a mask. He's coming to the hospital and you have to see him. What do we do to people who are not following the protocols? Um, I want to, the question was what is government doing to help? I believe that people look up to our leaders. I believe that optics in whatever we do is important. So if we are saying that people should wear their mask, our leaders, whether our political leaders, both divide, should do that. If we are saying that we should avoid gatherings, then we should be seeing that coming from the leadership. If they are avoiding gatherings, we will avoid gatherings. 
But then if we say that the drivers should be forced to wear their mask, and then the people who say they, we love the nation more than ourselves are not doing that, then I don't think that we can, we can say all we want to say, but people want to see leadership. People want to see direction. Once they have it, I'm sure we'll win this fight. Right. Okay. So we're nearing the end of proceedings, but there's still so much, <laughs> so much to get through. What we'll do now is we'll enjoy a video um, from Dr. Nsia Asari. Uh, and then right after that, uh, we might uh, take a couple of comments from the uh, audience. And then we'll come to our final uh, wave of contributions from our panelists, uh, looking at the way forward. So first, a round of applause, uh, Dr. Nsia Asari. This is Dr. Anthony Nsia Asari, Presidential Advisor on Health. And we are here to ask him a few questions on COVID-19 and how far we have come as a country. Dr. Nsia Asari, welcome. Thank you. So the first question, many people are not following the restrictions and a few who are following really feel restricted. Is government planning to review the COVID-19 restrictions? Uh, no, government is not planning to review the COVID-19 restrictions. We are still following the restrictions. Uh, unfortunately, those who feel very restricted, they are doing the right thing. But somebody who doesn't want to be restricted or is not following the restriction, what I always say is that uh, we say it in P. Good morning, Dr. Bidiaku. Dr. Bidiaku is an immunologist and we'll ask him a few questions about COVID-19. So, are there still lots of tests being done for COVID-19 and how is the positivity rate? Uh, yes, testing continues. I believe um, testing never really stopped. Uh, especially for travel. Um, so there's lots of testing. Actually, as we get closer to Christmas, um, we are seeing that the numbers of tests are rising. Uh, mostly a lot of the public lab, uh, sorry, the private labs are doing a lot of testing. I'm not entirely clear how much testing is being done at public hospitals. Um, we certainly have seen a decline in positivity up to this point, but of course now with increased movement due to travel and then the recent announcement of this new variant, uh, the Omicron variant, we are anticipating that positivity rates may rise again. But for now, positivity rates um, have dropped quite considerably over the last few months and currently are still quite low. So please, what can you tell us about the Omicron variant? What can you see? Well, Omicron is another variant similar to Delta or Alpha and Beta that we've heard about. It just has maybe a slightly more interesting name. Um, the Currently, what is known about it is that it has a very large number of mutations, more mutations than have been seen in any other variant. It has 50, at least 50 mutations. Um, and a large number of these mutations are in the spike protein. Um, currently, it's not clear how, um, how serious this variant is. The WHO has gone ahead to classify it as a variant of concern based on the sequence information. But the experiments to actually demonstrate whether it's more transmissible or more immune evasive are currently ongoing. So within another week to two weeks, we should have the first data out, um, most likely from South Africa, um, to indicate whether or not this variant actually is, is as concerning as it could be. Right now, we are just going based off the fact that it has certain mutations that give some, some cause for worry. And what do you think would be the game changer for Ghana and maybe the world at last for the virus now? Um, I mean, the biggest game changer has been the vaccine. We've managed to get vaccines within the shortest time that has ever been done. Um, and thankfully, the vaccines remain effective. Even against Omicron, the signs are that most likely the vaccines will still be effective against it at preventing severe disease and death. So the biggest game changer is the vaccine. However, you can, just having a vaccine doesn't make it effective. People have to actually avail themselves to get vaccinated. So the game changer will be when Ghana has 70% of the population vaccinated. Currently, we are way, way, way below that. So, and this is true around the world, um, even where vaccines are even more available than here. So I think uh, we've heard from the presidential advisor on health 
Dr. Nsian Sare, as well as uh, Dr. Yao, uh, why do I, Dr. Bediaku, uh, who is one of the leads among those who sequence the, the viruses in Ghana and at, at WACBIP as well as his private enterprise. We would want to take one or two comments from the, the floor and then maybe one, one, one or two questions from online and then we come for the closing remarks from our panelists so that we can round up. So, um, okay. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Dr. Sacha and I work in the emergency department. And thank you all so much, I mean the college and then the panelists for such a wonderful delivery. Think, talking about the impact of pandemic on us, you know, Ghana have had we have our own problems with endemic diseases, emerging diseases, communicable, non-communicable diseases already. And COVID really came to compound these problems. For those of us who work in the healthcare se sector, it's been extremely difficult for us over these years. And I, from the interviews, you notice that those who come close to the disease have a belief that it exists. For those who don't, for some good reasons, they don't believe that the diseases exist. That's why I think that I side with Hama, that just like we did for HIV, and just as some developed countries are doing that, maybe we cannot take the true stories of those who are, have experienced it, but we can make actors and actresses act them out and show it to the public so that they will see what we see on the front line. It is not easy seeing people suffer and go through what they do. And I believe that when we do so, people will come to terms and notice that it is true. For those who do not believe it is there, and I speak this to the general public. Get close to people who are educated so that you can be educated, and then you, you know that it is true. Dr. Oliver Komi from NSTEAM are telling us our, our behavior going into the Christmas is going to determine what comes out in January and February. I want to say that the healthcare system is already burdened. So please, general, general public, protect yourselves. Take all the precautions. Find reasons to take the vaccine and protect your loved ones as well. But most importantly, protect the healthcare system and the workers. It is extremely difficult, and to go through another wave as we have done will be extremely difficult on us. So those will be my comment, that as you, you, you go through the festivities, find a reason to protect you, your loved ones, and the healthcare system that will save you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doc. Find a reason to protect yourself and your loved ones. You don't want to be the reason for which after your chilling, your grandma got COVID from your visit and died. So find a reason. Doc, uh, madam, is there anything you want to share from your experience encouraging your people at Ecobank to vaccinate, for which you have about 70%, you said, vaccinations, and then another 14% of people who have at least one shot, isn't it? That, that, that is amazing. What did you do? What would you advise us to do? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I'll say it's a um, collaboration with my colleagues. I ensured, I encouraged them to take the vaccine. Sometimes I have to go an extra mile to contact those who have not taken the vaccine. Sometimes I have to share my experience on how I felt after taking the vaccine. Unfortunately, I didn't have any, any issues, so I share with them. They, they give me a promise that the next vaccine, I will see them, and surely they do. So I'm still contacting them, especially those who haven't taken the vaccine, who have other reasons for not taking the vaccine. Thank you. So I will also encourage those who have not taken the vaccine and those who think they are not ready. Some have other reasons like my senior colleague said, but those who don't have and think it's not necessary for them to take, I am pleading with them, they should. They should try and then take it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the ladies saying it softly, but you can see the firmness and passion in her voice. And uh, please take the vaccines, as she's saying. But I see one thing from what she said, which is 
people also taking out a responsibility to check on others and follow up with them until they actually take the vaccines. So those of us who have taken the vaccines, let's make that extra effort to take the vaccines and also encourage others to do what? To go for the vaccines once they are available. The churches, the market queens, the pastors, the media houses like Kujo or Kujo Mibua. True story. In fact, uh, Multimedia has set up uh, a station just outside Joy FM where we are giving vaccinations. Uh, people come there every day. Uh, we still need more and more people to come and take up these doses. Because as I understand it, we have what, about 14, to about 12 million doses in the system. Uh, if we all to take them up, we would suddenly be almost 50% vaccinated in Ghana. Right? Yeah. So, so why not? Uh, look, there is every reason to take it. I, I actually side with Hama, uh, who thinks that we shouldn't allow false information to spread. I agree. Maybe the way we should stop it from spreading is, is where there must be some finessing. Because there are some people who have platforms. They have platforms you can't stop. And they are using them to spread false information. Pastor who has a church in Sakumono. And from the very beginning, he said COVID doesn't exist. You know, actually, he started off saying COVID doesn't exist. Then he saw the financial benefit of saying it exists, but I have the cure. Uh, so he moved from COVID doesn't exist to I can cure COVID. He died of COVID. And the reason I bring him because he has a huge following. When he's preaching on the podium, nobody can shut him up. Nobody can debate him. When he's putting out his videos, nobody can challenge him. So the false information was going out and spreading and many of his own congregation became victims of that false information. So that's why I agree with Hammer. But maybe the way in which we combat it is where we disagree. I don't think you should shut them up. I think you should allow them to speak and then address what they say with experts. Have experts address what these people are saying. Because, I mean, once you sit down and you take your time and you, you unravel it, it doesn't make sense. So yeah, let them speak and let the experts address it. So we are informed. Uh, do we have some more contributions from uh, our online audience? Oh, yes. The online is buzzing with questions, and uh, we'll take a few of them uh, for the sake of time. Uh, Joe Edu wants to know, is Ghana considering booster shots for, for those who are in the high-risk category? Um, I think Dr. Asidi Bekwin answered that particular question, where he said that the focus of the nation at the moment is to make sure that at least everybody has had two shots, or if it's one shot, one shot, and then we can consider boosters, individual boosters. All right. Um, there are a few other questions um, online. In fact, a lot of questions. Um, we have low vaccine coverage and yet have enough vaccines. Why are we planning to have more tourists into the country? Um, <laughs> quite an interesting question. Yeah. Um, we tend to hear about COVID only when there's some law or when some law is to be passed about it. But our actions in town, markets, and on roads tell otherwise, plus the fact that our inability to adhere to protocol is not actually reflecting in the number of people getting sick with it. So I think. There are quite a lot of questions talking about the way forward in this matter. Um, some people are asking about, Godwin is asking, has there been any systematic approach to unravel why, vas why, why there's vaccine hesitancy? We should use carrot and stick, go with evidence-based SBCC so that at the same time, we can also stop the non-vaccinated from entering public spaces. I think recently, Ghana Health Service Director has announced some measures uh, going forward. So I think most of these questions dovetail into the way forward. And that is the point where we come back to our panelists. We've talked about COVID. Hammer has lived through it, confessed all his sins, 
Mama, I want to get those videos. I beg you. I, I, I want those videos. Uh, but, but personally, I, I'm a bit upset. Hama didn't apologize to me for, for, for stopping music in 2017. I still haven't forgiven you. I, I don't know, but we need to get the videos to know. You never know what he recorded. But Hama, please, we need those videos. You can't keep them. Anyway, so Hama has lived through it, came very close to death. In fact, our vice rector also was in there. Many people have been in there. The banks have, some of them have had to shut down. Some have lost businesses. Hotels have shut down. Some have sacked staff. Ecobank thankfully did not. Dr. Oliver Komi was running away from vaccines at a point. At work, he was scared. At home, he can't see his family for five months. And he said he has a fair wife. Uh, what that means, only God knows. But let's come back to the way forward. What do we do going forward to live in this new normal that we've all come to be saddled with? We have to move forward. What do we do? Uh, thank you very much. I know that we are all tired of wearing the mask. We appreciate that. We are all tired of washing our hands every day. We are tired of running away from our loved ones. But if we need to do that for maybe another six months, then we can forever and ever have our peace. Let us go at it. We have done two years of COVID. If we cannot wait another six months, then I think we have wasted the last two years. The passionate appeal is that we can all get COVID, but if we are not dying from COVID, then that is the good news. So please, let us, as much as possible, avail ourselves to the vaccines. Initially, we said there were no vaccines. Now there are vaccines. Let us prove our leaders wrong by saying that we are vaccinating, but there are no vaccines. So let us go out there and vaccinate. Let us hold dear to the prevention methods. Yes, Christmas is a time for coming together. Come together in love, but don't come together and cause disease. I think these are the things I will share. If we can hold dear to the principles that have brought us this far for the last two years, let us continue. The passionate appeal for my brother to all Ghanaians that spare the health workers, the trauma of looking for oxygen for you. Sometimes we have to share oxygen. And I'm sure without mentioning words, Hassan Yaga shared his experience, where sometimes we have to stop and go and give it to somebody else. And imagine that you can't breathe, and I say that you have had enough. Let me go and give it to the other person. If you don't want this for yourself, don't wish it for any other person. These are the things I want to share with us. Wow, thank you so much. Um, Daphne. Yeah, thank you very much. So a few points um, from my side as well, and just to add on to um, Dr. Komi. I think that as the vaccines are available now, we need to facilitate the vaccines coming to um, us, you know, the communities, our people. So it's good to know that the churches are organizing vaccinations on premises. Um, companies and corporate institutions should also try and organize the vaccines on premises so that as many uh, people, I mean, the peer pressure and the influence, the awareness is, you know, within the workspace and, and the um, locations where we have these large gatherings. And so we should facilitate the vaccination um, exercise. We also have to continuously enforce the protocols that are in place. Um, the, the continuous sanitizing of our, our public services, ensuring that people are masked up before they enter any of our premises, providing these um, basic needs um, in our offices, our churches, you know, the, the locations where they are gathering, we need to make them available. We also need to ensure that that education is stepped up across. I mean, for the, 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 those who are hesitant, I mean, the solution is that we have the educated, informed, um, decisions and reasons why uh, the vaccines are important. So that stepped up awareness should be an, encouraged. And for, um, lastly, for the corporate institutions, it's important that we clearly spell out 
the policies and the protocols around working. You know, if people are unclear what the procedures are to work from home, not to work from home, who is able to work from home remotely and who is not. If these things are clearly um, laid out across all institutions and, and people are supported through it, whether working on site, you are supported, you are supported, whether working remotely, you are not, you know, left out and neglected. These are the things that are going to ensure that we are in the middle of a pandemic, but everybody has a shoulder to lean on. Everybody has a stake in ensuring that we come out of this, you know, um, a, 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 in a better uh, shape and quicker than we all anticipate. So this, these will be my um, contribution to the way forward. Thank you very much. Uh, well, Hama, your, your vision is quite clear. Your mission is clear. You want to crusade and, you know, fight the stigma. You want to educate people. Uh, what in particular do you think that those watching, listening can do uh, to either support you uh, or also to, to, in their own way, let this man down? Well, um, um, I recommend watching my video. It has um, um, a wealth of knowledge in there and experience. Um, I said it in there that I believe eventually everybody will get COVID. The fight will come down to who is armed enough to prevent severe COVID or to prevent death. So it will eventually become like the normal common cold, I think. So the, the trick is how armed are you? Are you vaccinated? Are you, are you eating well? Are you living the right lifestyle? Because it's the lifestyle. The people going for Im uh, immune booster shots, it's lame. Your lifestyle has to change totally. You know, I've had to, I, I, I saw everything, the, I, I learned everything the hard way. And I believe that people need to change their lifestyles now. Smokers should stop immediately. Um, there are some things that when you get COVID, it will massacre you if you are in, 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 uh, indulging in such things. My luck was that when I caught COVID, now let me put this out there. I was the most um, careful person. I actually moved to work from home. I was signing checks from home. They had to come and pick them and take them to the office. I canceled going out. I worked from home. My kids, GSS kids, are in the body house, KB Clear, in Ada. My SS kids are in school. I'm the only one at home with my cook and the girl who comes to clean and goes. I don't know how I caught COVID. When I, I do a delivery, I spray the rubber bag. I mean, I was the most careful, but I hadn't taken the vaccine for one reason because I was waiting to see what will happen to those who took it. <laughs> in the beginning, I didn't understand it. It was so sudden. I'm like, hey, people are complaining. Let me see what will happen to this guy. You know, my, my estate, people went to Ajingano to do their own. They came back, I was trying to meet them. Are you okay? You know, after one week, I wanted to see if they were okay. Before I went, I hadn't gone. This thing happened to me and up to now, I don't understand how I got it. That is why it is important that you arm yourself now. If I had taken the vaccine, I wouldn't have gone through what I went through. So I recommend that they go and watch the video. The video is, I mean, I put everything out there. And like I said, we, will, we, we might eventually all get COVID, but you need to arm yourself to fight it. Thank you. Uh, I think we're going to uh, get Dr. Asidu Bekwin to give us his thoughts on the way forward. And, and Doc, if you could uh, touch on the psychological aspect of this. This is a part that we haven't spent too much time on today. And that's typical because we always leave that at, at last. But what is the Ghana Health Service and all other authorities doing to deal with the psychological effect so far 
and into the future of COVID-19. Some uh, some interference there. Oh, good. Oh, we can hear you now, Doc. Please continue. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, if, if I may, if I may make a suggestion, Doc, this detail about how long it takes for a vaccine to become fully protective, this 28-day period, if I may, can I suggest that that information is highlighted, especially as we go into Christmas, because the messaging that we have received from government is that if you have been vaccinated, then you can attend events. But obviously there is a qualifier. So can we ensure that that information is put out? 
so that you know we don't end up having people come out and put themselves and others in danger because they think they are protected when they are not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, so, um, I'm sorry. I think I cut you when you were not done. So please wrap it up for us. Thank you very much. Dr. Franklin Asiru Bekwe. And uh, we, we have to apologize uh, on behalf of Hama. He has an emergency. He had to leave us. Uh, we are very grateful to him for the time he spent with us. Uh, and in fact, we're grateful to all of our panelists for the insightful uh, conversation that they have led us through. Let's give them a round of applause. Uh, also, a big thank you to those who participated online, uh, spending all your time with us this evening. We appreciate it. A big thank you to those of you who heeded our invitation and uh, came in to join us here. Uh, we appreciate you very much. I think we're uh, at the point where we're about to wrap up. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, because we've spoken about the psychological effects of COVID-19, um, I think there's one thing I want us to all realize, that nobody is spared the psychological effects. We are all suffering some level of psychological impact from COVID-19. Sometimes it's something very small, like the these masks are having on us. It just occurred to me today, there's a colleague of mine, uh, Mami C. Thompson. She's actually here this evening covering this event for joy. It just occurred to me that I every day, but I haven't seen her face in probably about two years. I don't remember any time when she's been without a mask. It, it is slowly creating a certain division between us where we are unable to connect with each other in the ways we used to be able to. We have to be aware of it and mitigate against it. In other countries, they do things deliberately to keep people connected. They have a whole team in the United Kingdom sitting in a call center who are just picking up the phone and calling everyone to ask, are you okay? How are you doing? just so that people who are isolated will have someone to talk to. So we stay connected. You know, so let's all be aware of it. It's affecting us all. So let's see if we can try and manage and find ways around it so that we stay connected, we stay mentally healthy, and we can beat this thing together. Kojo, you couldn't have said it better. So um, I think all good things still have an end. And we are just coming to the end of this. Uh, we've learned a lot, we've discussed a lot. There's still more to discuss, but I believe the discussions can continue in our homes. All of us have learned, all of us have discussed and shared. Let's continue this, as uh, the, the lady from Ecobank mentioned, that let's continue to encourage each other to follow the rules, follow the protocols, and get vaccinated, as she said. Um, we would want to I, I skipped one important person who was in, uh, has had to also step out because Dr. Gerald Janyofio was here. He said he couldn't have passed by without standing in. He was the immediate uh, parliamentary candidate, MPP parliamentary candidate for La Dade Kotokong. He came and sat in throughout the whole session and has had to leave. Uh, he's also a lecturer at uh, UPSA. Uh, we want to acknowledge his presence for gracing the occasion as well. Uh, at this juncture, I would want to call the vice rector of the college, Dr. Henry Lawson, to give us his closing remarks. So good evening, everybody. We are grateful to the team that um, that did this program. 
I want to acknowledge a few of our senior colleagues from the college that I saw online, especially Professor Lade Wosonu, who has the issues of the college at heart and is always supporting us quietly in the background. I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Albert Apalu, who is the Secretary General of the West Africa College of Physicians. He was also online with us. I want to especially um, agree with one of the participants who said that we should find innovative ways of killing the vaccine hesitancy. And he called on uh, musicians and actors to try and enact what people are saying they do not see. Let us get them, because I keep saying that since the, the COVID went down and the movie industry started, I'm yet to see a movie where people were wearing face masks. It's as if it's not one of the things people want to uh, get people to see, but it's the new normal, and that's why we are talking about this. He hasn't seen a colleague's, colleague's face for two years. And currently, sometimes, um, you, you, you meet people with a mask. And for the next six weeks to eight weeks or three months, you're working with them, you haven't seen their face before. And then, for some reason, you go for dinner, and that one, everybody has to take off their masks. Then you don't re recognize the people you are sitting with. Meanwhile, you've known and talked to them for about three years. That is what we are saying is the new normal. And we all need to adjust to some of these new things. But the key to us is that COVID is still with us, and let us not rest on our oars. Let us push and make sure that Ghanaians are safe. We do apologize for the late start and the late close for, of this program, but we know that you have benefited. Thank you all very much. And the apologies are weak. If, if, the, the applause is weak. We have to see something. Aha, aha, aha. That means you enjoyed the, 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 the discussions and all that went into it. Thank you so much, Dr. Henry Lawson, Vice Rector. And uh, at this juncture, we'll call on Madam Hetty Ferguson Lane. Are you a Ghanaian? <laughs> to give us the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salome. Um, I stand here on behalf of the rector of the college to say a big thank you to say a big thank you to all of us. I would like to start by saying thank you to Dr. Oliver Kome, Mrs. Opong. I can see Hama is still standing in the corner there. And then um, Dr. Esie Dubekwing. These are very busy people, but when we called on them, they have graced our occasion, and we are very grateful to them for doing that for us. Shall we put our hands together for them once again? <laughs> to our invited guests, who were here, um, Dr. Akpalu, and everybody who was invited to join us. Prof. Um, Ohene is still here with us. Thank you so much. We are grateful to you. To our brothers who are sitting here, the ever forgiving Dr. Selume and his friend, his new brother, Kojo Yangson. Thank you so much, old brother then. Thank you very much for moderating the sessions for us. To our media partners, we are grateful to you. Joy News, GTV, TV3, Ghana Web, Metro TV, and City TV. Thank you so much. To Dr. Nketia and his team. Dr. Nketia, please, can we see you? The planning committee for this group, for this program. Shall we see you? Shall we see the members, please? Where are they? Shall we put our hands together for them? They've done a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. To management of college and staff, we are grateful to you. And finally, to our audience, those here and virtually, we say thank you to you and God bless, God bless us all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You refuse to answer my question whether you're a Ghanaian, but uh, I'll go to the Supreme Court on this matter. We'll resolve it later. So at this juncture, we'll take a closing prayer from no other than the chairman of the Organizing committee, the publicity committee. Oh, Chairman Pa, you are clapping weak like this. No, please, before you pray, the, the, the clap must be correct. Let's welcome him with a clap offering, as the pastors will say. Correct. Thank you uh, very much, Brother Salome. Shall we please bow for a prayer? Father, we thank you for this period of preparation and for this program. 
We thank you for letting it be a success. We pray that, oh God, what we've learned here will go a long way to help us as a country, even as we move through this new normal. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for spending the time. Uh, it's some small item, what? Because the, the program actually went beyond 13, so I'm wondering. Outside, so as you go out, uh, you can take something small home as you go. The, the panelists, the rector and his team, and the organizing team, please just one second in front here for some quick, quick COVID-19 adherent pictures. So thank you very, very much. Okay. The, 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 the IT guys, can you play one of our brothers, the last two for me? Open the door, open the door. I'm coming. Mama, do you remember? <laughs> 